Today we are joined by Mr Jacob Mitchell, the Chief Investment Officer and Founder of Antipodes. Jacob, as the founder of the company, can you tell us a little bit about your background and the history of the company? We uh, founded Antipodes in uh, March 2015 as a high conviction manager of global and Asian equities, both long only and long short. You know, we clearly have a focus on capital preservation. Uh, previously, I worked for 14 years at uh, Platinum Asset Management, most recently the, the Deputy CIO. Uh, responsible for um, just over three and a half billion of of farm uh, in a direct management sense, and um, you know it, it was a for me Antipodes is just simply the next step in a you know a record of high conviction investing. Uh, we've built out a team um, across the team. We have over 100 years of experience in global equities investing. And uh, we are also partnering with Pinnacle, primarily as the provider of our infrastructure and our, our distribution support. And, um, and that allows the, the investment team to really focus on, on investing. And um, where uh, we launched our funds in uh, 1 July 2000. 2015, and uh, we, uh, you know, we're very um, sort of enthusiastic in terms of how we manage in, uh, the business, and uh, you know, we, we see the benefits of creating a structure of, of very tight alignment between uh, investors and the investment team. How is your investment team aligned with investors? We've decided to um, offer the products with performance fees to put a fair amount of the firm's compensation at risk in the sense that if the investment team doesn't produce performance, then the, you know, the, ultimately there will be a fairly small uh, bonus pool. If the investment team is successful, and we, we look at this over the, over the medium to long term, so three to five years, then there is that great outcome for investors and the investment team, and I think that's the best way of creating a simple, transparent alignment. What are the investment objectives of the fund, and what is your investable universe? The ob objective of the fund is to deliver absolute returns in a, in a risk-adjusted sense over the investment cycle, three to five years, and, um, and to do it in a high-conviction capital preservation approach. Um, in terms of the benchmark, uh, we, we do measure against the benchmark as a way to calculate our, our performance fee, but we are really benchmark unaware investors. Uh, the benchmark for the global funds is the MSCI All Countries World Index, uh, but we are no, in no way constrained by that index. We can invest in developed markets, emerging markets, and really, our universe of opportunities uh, are the are in large capitalisation companies. So, companies we're targeting typically companies greater than two billion dollar market cap. And our, in that sense, there's over four thousand companies that that uh, that are larger than two billion dollar market cap. So there's a there's a vast opportunity set for us to take advantage of. Can you talk through the investment philosophy behind your strategy? We see investment returns as a function of um, the, the, the business, the quality, the resilience of the business. You're buying its, its, its and that is ultimately measured by its, the sustainability of its competitive advantage. And then it's a function of what you pay for that business. So that, that is our definition of return. Our definition of risk is a combination of uh, stock, stock level risk. So we control that by buying businesses cheaply. You know, mar margin of safety protects you from that permanent loss of capital, which is, which is what real stock level risk is all about. But it's more than just resilient businesses, it's resilient investments. And that's the concept of multiple ways of winning. So your investment case cannot be dependent on just one single factor outcome. The second aspect of risk is going beyond stocks. It is the behavior of the overall portfolio. So when we're looking for opportunities, as a high conviction manager, we're only looking for 30 to 50 stocks in a universe of 4,000 companies. That means we can be very selective and we can build portfolios with non-correlated sources of alpha. 
So the next question is, why should you be able to buy those selective stocks at a discount to intrinsic value? And we think that happens because markets can tend to be irrational around changes in the environment that are impacting businesses. Those changes that we see typically fall into three buckets. They're either cyclical, structural, or they're broad socio-macroeconomic changes. It's when markets become ir irrational that you get the opportunity to buy the company a great business at a great price. Your investment approach talks about the market's tendency for irrational extrapolation. What does this actually mean for investors? The, the concept of resilience or sustainable competitive advantage must be subjected to ongoing tests because the problem with really resilient businesses that are highly profitable is they attract competition. And uh, in a cyclical framework, that typically means uh, capacity or new competition uh, leading to um, capacity expansion in an industry. And then when there's a small change in demand, that's enough to tip the industry into the shakeout phase. Uh, in a structural sense, it is a, a strong incumbent that becomes quite lazy, uh, starts to feed off its profit pool, profiteer, and opens up a price umbrella for new competition. In both situations, it's really about you know, challenges that are facing the business, whether they are technological or competitive or regulatory or simply management missteps. And that is what typically allows us, and uh, only with a disciplined fundamental approach can you determine whether the the impacts are, are permanent or temporary. But it's that irrational, that's what we describe as irrational extrapolation around those factors that opens up an opportunity to buy a business, a great business at a great price. That's what we mean by irrational extrapolation. And uh, we bucket that as cyclical, structural, and socio-macroeconomic. And uh, it's ultimately a continuum. All three factors impact businesses at, at, at all points in time. In terms of process, how do you select stocks for the portfolio? Best way to describe it is an eclectic approach. It's a combination of the qualitative experience of the team and, uh, and pretty heavy use of quantitative tools. Uh, in our experience, the combination of both is very powerful. Um, we also manage the team as a scarce resource. We're ultimately a performance-based research organisation. So before we go too deep into a project, um, we like to use the quant. The quant experience is, is very good for getting a broad perspective before we go too deep. And also we use a, a buddy system whereby each lead, a lead analyst on a project also has a buddy assigned. And the role of the buddy and, uh, and the role of the investment team before we go too deep is to act as a sounding board for the promoter of the idea to provide a reality check. And the reality check is around a common sense test of the likelihood of a margin of safety, multiple ways of winning, and the likely diversified nature of the alpha outcome relative to what we already own. So the existing portfolio informs the investment process. We won't research ideas that we already believe we are fully exposed to within the portfolio. We can be selective, we can work on something that does have a non-correlated alpha profile. Please describe how you integrate your considerations of environmental, social and governance issues in your investment process. Consideration of enviro environment, social and governance factors is done as a part of the deep dive research process. Uh, we see it as a, ultimately a, a way that we measure the performance of, of management. And in our investments, we're looking for a, a, a minimum uh, acceptable level of, of performance. And, uh, and then ultimately, to the extent that companies that we have invested in uh, do um, start to fail in this area, um, on a case-by-case -case assessment, we, we uh, may choose to actually divest the company. So it is seen as a, an important part of uh, controlling risk around management behaviour is simply 
the the study of the track record. The track record is the best in indicator of future performance by management in this area. You manage a concentrated portfolio. How do you manage this risk? So we, we manage concentration risk through two principles, minimum level of diversification and secondly, diversified sources of alpha. So what does that mean? Um, for us, the minimum level of diversification is, is, is you know, 30 to 50 stocks. Why? Because beyond 30 stocks, you get most of the random benefits of diversification from a, from a protection from unknown risks, the risks that you can't control, that gives you most of those benefits. Diversified sources of alpha is a little bit more of a, a qualitative assessment of risk where we, we, we believe we can control and measure build-ups of similarity in the portfolio and, and making sure that the portfolio is, is, will behave in a way where if there is a shock, you know, maybe it's a, a certain outcome tail risk event, we know where the concentrations of risk are and we have diversified our alpha source sufficiently to protect against those sorts of outcomes. Your strategy can have a broad allocation across the globe. How do you manage currency risk within the portfolio? So we, we see currency as another risk that we need to manage. So when we buy a stock, we also buy a currency. As a part of our consideration of socio-macroeconomic uh, factors, uh, we consider that currency risk. And if our fundamental, based on our fundamental valuation models of currencies, if we, if we uh, believe the currency is significantly overvalued uh, and we do apply a, a higher margin of safety in that assessment because of the unknown risk around anything that is macro in its assessment, um, we will hedge out of that currency into a currency that we, we feel is, is more attractive on a, as a, an evaluation sense. Uh, that is um, ultimately a, a, a strategic uh, view, and so our currency views are, are very high conviction in that sense. Being a global equity strategy, how do you determine the geographical disposition of the portfolio? As an index unaware manager, uh, we simply invest where we see opportunities. So we're looking for, you know, those high conviction ideas, regardless of where they're located. And ultimately, the goal is to build those portfolios in a, in a non-correlated alpha outcome. So that will, in a, in a sense, put a certain limit on how much exposure we will have to any one regional sector, but we're not constrained by the benchmark. Your strategy can use short selling. How do you determine when you use short selling within the portfolio? We short sell for three reasons. Ultimately, drive alpha. Uh, sometimes we also get the opportunity to hedge a specific risk on the long side. And also there are times when we want to protect the portfolio from tail, tail risk. In terms of how we execute in stocks, we're looking for companies in a cyclical sense that are really on the tipping point from the exuberance to the shakeout phase. Uh, and then in a, a structural sense, it is looking for those incumbents that may have lost focus and hence have opened up a, uh, a window for a, a, an incumbent to disrupt their business. And then you'll very common today, you often see um, markets become very enthusiastic around the disruptors and irrational extrapolation kicks in. But um, when you actually assess the underlying business model, what you have is an investment theme, not a resilient investment. And a, a small change in the environment can, um, can see those companies come, uh, come under real operational strain. That's also another source of, of short opportunity. So cyclical, incumbents that are being disrupted and then disruptors that are actually just weak businesses. Three opportunities for us to short. How does using tools like short selling and derivatives help the portfolio to manage risk? Well, when we, we short sell, either in single stock or in a index, we are reducing our net exposure to markets. In the case of uh, currencies, we use typically forwards 
to reduce our net exposure to expensive currencies. So both of those combined have, have great risk management characteristics. In terms of exposure, what is your typical net invested position within your global long short strategy? The typical net exposure limit is 50 to 100 percent and there's a gross limit of 150 percent. Now the gross limit is a combination of the aggregate longs plus the aggregate short exposure. It cannot exceed more than 150 percent of the fund. Within your global long short fund, what sort of investor does the strategy suit and what is the recommended time frame for investment? So the fund suits an investor who's looking for exposure to global equities in a, in a high conviction capital preservation uh, approach and uh, is also looking for the benefits of shorting and currency management. Uh, in addition to that, there are those benefits of being able to gain exposure to industries that are not represented in the local Australian stock market and also diversification away from Australian assets.